In this video, I'm going to tell you what I view programming languages research to be. This is a reprise of a talk that I gave at the Programming Languages Mentoring Workshop in 2019, co-located with the Symposium on the Principles of Programming Languages, POPL, in Lisbon, Portugal. My talk starts with a conversation that I had with colleagues back in 2014 during hiring season. I insisted to them that we ought to consider hiring in programming languages amongst the other areas of computer science that we were interested in. Some of them had doubts. They wondered, is programming languages really the best area to spend our resources in? Isn't it really an old problem and largely solved? Now, of course, being from within the field, I see it quite differently. I see a vibrant community doing amazing things. But it's not clear that my colleagues necessarily know what those amazing things are. At first glance, you could say, well, programming languages researchers work on programming languages. Which is true, but many of these languages seem to not be developed directly anyway by academics. Uh, and so that leads you to wonder whether or not there are big research contributions to make within an academic department in PL. What might those contributions be? Well, trying to answer that question, I decided that there's a lot to say, not just a little, and I should start a blog, and I did with Swarat Chaudhuri, called The PL Enthusiast. About two years into having produced that blog, I actually wrote a blog post directly about the question of what programming languages research is. Programming languages research views the programming language as having a central place in solving computing problems. A PL researcher, in my view, develops general abstractions or building blocks for solving problems, and maybe more importantly, classes of problems. A PL researcher considers software behavior in a fundamental and rigorous and general way to prove that classes of programs enjoy properties that we would like those programs to have and don't have the properties we don't want them to have. The ethos of PL research is not just to find solutions, though. It's to find the best expressions of those solutions, typically in the form of a kind of language or language extension, maybe a library or a separate after-the-fact analysis or program transformation. And the hope of the PL approach is for simple, understandable solutions that are also general. By being part of or acting at the level of a language, they can apply to many and many sorts of problems uh, and programs. So let me step back and uh, give you an example to show what I mean. This is the quicksort implementation in Haskell. It defines a function sort that takes a list as an argument. And the way that it works is it picks a pivot element x, the first element of the list, and then it concatenates all elements less than x, lesser, with all elements greater than x, greater, with x in the middle. And uh, lesser and greater are determined by this where clause that individually sorts uh, all those elements on either side of the pivot. Now, a way to optimize the efficiency of this program would be to parallelize it. That is, we could use Haskell's parallel Haskell extension, and in particular its par and pseq combinators, to sort greater and lesser in parallel with uh, each other, and then, when finished, could concatenate those results uh, just as we did in the single-threaded version. Now, why would that optimization that we have here done by hand be sensible? Uh, that is, why would we actually expect to, in every case, get a sorted list? Well, the thinking might go like this. The two halves of the input list can be constructed in parallel. There's no, uh, there's no problem with doing that in separate threads. This is because each activity is independent, and this would make sense to do for better performance as long as PAR and PSEQ manage parallel resources efficiently. Uh, that is, that the overhead of communicating, uh, of forking threads, and so on, does not dwarf the benefit of performing the activities in parallel. And maybe um, we can assume that the runtime system of parallel Haskell will do these things properly. So that's a one-off optimization. We could generalize this basic approach by rather than 
looking at an individual program and making spot optimizations, we could develop an algorithm to look at any possible program to identify components to pick in parallel, to, to run in parallel. And we could uh, make sure that that algorithm chooses those subcomponents in such a way that parallelizing them does not compromise the correctness of the program and is likely to improve performance. So in fact, uh, this thesis that I've quoted the front page of improves implicit parallelism by doing exactly this, by automating uh, much of the process of parallelizing a program. So I think of this as the essence of programming language research because we're lifting a problem that we might have applied in a one-off fashion, say to an individual program, parallelize parts of it by rewriting parts of the program, to an entire language that is develop an analysis and transformation that takes any program and attempts to parallelize parts of it. Here's another example. This one actually is written up a bit more uh, in detail on my blog, and it's an authenticated data structure. So what is an authenticated data structure? Well, the idea is that we want to offload the storage of uh, some data structure onto an untrusted server, but nevertheless have trusted clients be able to query that server and uh, trust those responses. And the way that it will uh, do that is to have the server send along a proof that the query that it's answering uh, is high integrity, that it's authentic, it's correct. The way to do this was uh, first proposed in 1988 by Ralph Merkel in his so-called Merkel tree. And uh, you can think of this as a particular sort of data structure where the tree is organized to have a bunch of uh, metadata as part of it, so-called recursive hashes that are hard for uh, an untrustworthy server to forge and uh, therefore hard to fake out a client in when it checks whether or not the, the proof, which consists of a sequence of these hashes, is correct. Now this basic idea, while applied for complete trees here, maybe it makes sense to apply to other data structures. And in fact, over the years, since 1988, it has been applied to sets and dictionaries and range trees and graphs and skip lists and B trees and hash trees. And in fact, um, each of these different data structures has warranted a separate paper and a separate security proof. Now, the PL perspective is to say, instead of resolving the same problem over and over again in a slightly different context, can we take one general step and create a language extension in which all of those particular instances could be coded up? So that's exactly what we did in 2014 with our paper on authenticated data structures. And, we'll, and uh, our approach was to extend a language with a, small, uh, with a small extension that captured the essence of the authenticity proof in a authenticated data structure. And we proved once and for all that type correctness in this language extension implies authenticity. So from that point on, just program your data structure in our language and you can be sure that the security proof holds. No need to do further proofs, no need to write additional papers that contain one-off proofs for those particular data structures. So, what are the elements of PL research now that you have an idea of the way I view it? Well, a key aspect is design. What problem is it that you're trying to solve and what method are you going to use to solve it? What language feature will you develop? What analysis or transformation will you put together to solve it? Once you have an idea for your solution, very uh, typically mathematics and proof come into play. What does this language feature mean? What does this extension mean? Why is it correct? What is the argument that uh, your approach is correct? Then there is implementation, extend a language, uh, extend an analysis, develop a transformation, and then finally empirically evaluate it. Does this design or implementation actually work? Can we build lots of authenticated data structures? Can we parallelize, parallelize lots of interesting programs? Uh, do we actually see good performance? Is the system easy to use? And so on. To do all of these things, programming languages researchers tend to draw on a particular toolbox. This toolbox consists of 
components such as language specification. So what is the feature or syntax of the thing you're developing? Semantics, this comes back to mathematics, using technology such as operational or denotational semantics. Static reasoning, so being able to make statements, proofs about whole programs or classes of program, and those statements will involve logics, that is uh, the statement will be made in a logic, and maybe we'll use things like type systems or static analysis uh, to prove properties about those programs. Programming languages researchers also use dynamic reasoning about individual executions, whether as part of a language design, as part of a separate testing mechanism, as part of a monitor, and uh, all of these things one implements to show that they work in practice, whether by using compilation or interpretation uh, or other runtime system services. So what I want to do now is give you a tour of programming languages research considering all of these elements in the toolbox that I just presented. And um, before I do, of course, I should disclaim that this is my perspective. Other people are sure to differ with me about what programming, programming languages research is about. I'm not presenting a comprehensive view. There's lots of exciting things in the field happening that I won't specifically mention in this talk. And I'm likely to make some hopefully small mistakes, and I hope you'll forgive me for that and see the big picture of the point I'm trying to get across. That is that you'll get some sense of the field. So I'm going to start at the end of that list of uh, bits of the programming languages toolbox, the implementation of a programming language. Now I want to start with the observation that machines don't run the programs that we write. Instead, machines tend to run machine code, and machine code is normally uh, produced by another program. So uh, for a particular programming language, there are several implementation strategies. One is to have an interpreter. Uh, I can have a program that is able to run on a particular machine, and it takes as input a program in a different language, language Q, and executes that program. Another approach is the compiler. It converts a program in a particular language to one in a language for which you have a machine or an interpreter. So if uh, that language Q is, say, the C programming language, I could run the GCC compiler to compile that program to x86 machine code, language L, and then run that directly on the machine. Uh, alternatively, if my programming language was, say, Haskell, I could compile it to C code which could then be compiled to machine code, or I could compile it to, say, strangely, JavaScript, and then I could interpret JavaScript inside of my web browser. A hybrid strategy is to begin by interpreting the program, but then compile it as the program runs. And this is a way of amortizing the cost of compilation over the execution of the program, rather than having to set aside a large amount of time, potentially, to compile it at the outset. Now, whatever strategy you take, typically there are additional services that need to be implemented in support of uh, that strategy, that compiler or interpreter. And two common ones are the garbage collector, which handles memory management, and a thread system, which runs multiple parallel threads. So the compiler or the interpreter will use those services uh, in its implementation to implement programs in the language. The libraries of the language oftentimes are also considered uh, part of the language implementation and part of the runtime system. So the implementation of strings or of numbers or of services like networking or a file system, those often are part of a system library that is really important and necessary for the language to work. So there's lots of research in programming languages on implementing them better. Back from the early days, um, we were concerned about implementing compilers to be efficient so that they could optimize programs to run more quickly. Uh, these days, we look at things like special purpose hardware, GPUs, uh, and try to take advantage of those. Garbage collection is still uh, an important area of research, trying to make it faster, uh, to have smaller pause times, to be more space efficient. Uh, Just-in-time compilation is very popular today. Lots of languages are 
JIT compiled. And so that's also an important area of research. And uh, as programming language styles proliferate, implementation strategies for those styles become increasingly important. So for example, two popular areas uh, today are probabilistic programming for tasks like machine learning or for programs that operate over uncertain data and uh, programming neural networks for deep learning and again trying to implement those languages to optimize the programs that are written in them. Uh, since this talk was given at PLMW at Popol, I tried to include and here have a list of papers from Popol 19 that are part of this research category for programming languages and the one paper that uh, I found that clearly fit into implementation was this one, Efficient Parameterized Algorithms for Data Packing. Okay, so the next category I want to consider is semantics, and in particular, formal semantics. Because programming languages researchers are interested in working with programs, whole classes of programs, it's important to know what those programs mean. Uh, the word semantics comes from the Greek word semeno, to mean. Now, most language semantics, even today, are informal. That is, they're text documents that try to explain in legalistic style language what a particular language construct should do when it's executed. But we can do a bit better, and often do, in the programming languages research field by making semantics formal, that is mathematical, rather than informal, i.e. textual. And there's two main styles here. One is called operational semantics, so this is kind of like an interpreter, but written in math. And the other is denotational semantics, and that's like a compiler, where I'm going to compile from my program in my programming language to math. And so I have a mathematical interpretation, say, of a function written in the language. Formal semantics has been a topic of research for uh, many decades now, and it is a standard part of the PL researcher's toolbox. So looking at those two main styles of semantics, operational semantics being the first, evaluation here is described as a series of transitions in some abstract machine. So in a sense, the, mathematics the mathematically explained transitions define an interpreter for that language. The meaning of a program can be thought of as it's fully reduced, that is uh, a transition step after step after step until no further transitions are possible. Uh, that form. So for example, if I have this program, let x equal 2 and x plus 3, then I can transition to a program that substitutes x with 2, so that now I have 2 plus 3, and then finally performs the sum to get 5. So the meaning of the program on the very left is 5, because that is the rightmost fully reduced form. Operational semantics is the most popular style of semantics simply because it is straightforward to use and uh, in the sense that it's easy to write down transition rules and it's easy to use those rules to prove properties uh, about programs in, in a language defined that way. Importantly, operational semantics can be used to model many programming language features that appear in modern languages today, like concurrency, nondeterminism, uh, and so on, and it can model uh, meta properties like runtime cost, um, which are important for, say, proving things about the running time of programs. The other style of language semantics is denotational semantics, and as I said, this is like interpreting the program as a mathematical object by, in a sense, compiling to that mathematics, and this compilation happens via a so-called interpretation function with these semantic brackets. So the meaning of a program fragment is given by the meaning of its components. It's compositional. So E1 plus E2 is defined as the meaning of E1 and the meaning of E2. Those things are likely to be, say, mathematical numbers, and the meaning, therefore, of the whole program is the sum of those two numbers. Denotational semantics becomes uh, interesting, challenging, when we face modeling loops or rec recursive functions or when worrying about the heap. Uh, worrying about cycles inside of the heap. Denotational semantics was, uh, is often used for equational reasoning, that is to say when two programs are equivalent, perhaps under particular, uh, under certain contexts of interest. 
So today, um, semantics are often used out of the box for other research purposes, but they are also a subject of research itself. So um, denotational semantics is experiencing a bit of a revitalization. It used to be that uh, operational semantics was the only thing uh, I would see at conferences, except for the, the odd paper. But now the number of papers and the interest is growing again because it's becoming very interesting uh, for a bunch of important applications, for example, security applications. So at Pobble 19, there were several papers that uh, explored either new mathematics for semantics, new semantic, um, new presentations of the meaning of programming languages, and those using uh, standard semantics techniques. Okay, so next I want to turn to static reasoning about programs in a programming language. What is a static analysis? A static analysis is an analysis, it is a function that takes another program as its argument, and its goal is to establish that, all, uh, that any program that it's given as an argument, that program P, enjoys a property R. So for example, a static analysis might like to show that a particular program uh, that it's given as an argument has no runtime failures uh, or always terminates. Now, uh, one way we could attempt to prove this property of all executions of a program would be to run the program on all possible, on, uh, all possible inputs to see, well, in fact, do they always terminate? Uh, do we see that there are no runtime failures? But of course, this is impractical because not all runs will terminate, and in fact, there may be an infinite number of runs. So instead, um, static analysis techniques need to perform some sort of abstraction so that they can actually terminate and make some sort of judgment. And uh, over the decades, many different static analysis algorithms and techniques have been developed. Uh, the two that I'm going to talk about next are type systems and abstract interpretation, especially because these are quite popular at Popple. Before I get into those techniques, uh, a bit about terminology. You will often hear about an analysis being either sound or complete. A static analysis that attempts to prove a property, R, um, can be either sound or complete. So for example, let's say that the property R is the program has no runtime errors. Then I will write S of P is true is meant to imply that P has no runtime errors. Now, an analysis is sound if when it says the property holds, it does. That is, S of P is true implies that the program exhibits that property R. On the flip side, an analysis is complete if when a program exhibits that property, the static analysis says that it does. Now, uh, obviously what we would like is to have an analysis that is both sound and complete, and we'll get to that, but let's look at examples of uh, one or the other. Here on the diagram on the right, we see the pro all programs in the world are stored in this square, uh, or depicted in this square, and those in the green area are meant to be programs that exhibit R, they have no error, or do not exhibit R, they do have an error. So we see a bunch of example programs there, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. And an analysis uh, that says it is depicted as um, those two circles, tool A, tool B, and tool C, uh, where tool B is this uh, funny pentagon shaped. And what does the analysis mean? Well, every program that appears inside of that shape is uh, one for which the analysis returns true. That is, the analysis claims that it exhibits the property. So if we look at tool A, we can see that it's sound because uh, P2 and P3, and in fact all the programs inside of its circle, really do exhibit the property R, just as the analysis says that they do. Um, on the other hand, tool A is clearly not complete because there are programs such as P1, which exhibit that property R, but tool A doesn't say that they do. Tool A won't say false for P1, even though P1 exhibits the property we care about. Now, on the other hand, tool B is complete. Every single program that exhibits R, that is all those programs in the green on the left-hand side, uh, the analysis will say true for, 
But unfortunately, the analysis will also return true for some programs that don't exhibit the property, uh, that it is, it's not sound, and that, uh, for example, P5 is uh, within the shape of tool B. Now, most uh, static analyses um, that are used as tools in practice that have went out and bought one would be in the, ca the category of neither sound nor complete. And so that's like tool C, that some large number of programs with no error, indeed are, uh, the analysis says there's no error, but in some cases it will also uh, falsely claim, like for P1, that a program has an error when it doesn't, or will fail to implicate a program like P5 that actually has an error. Now, unfortunately, no static analysis for any interesting property can be both sound and complete. This is a consequence of Rice's theorem. So what that means is that to have a static analysis tool, uh, we're going to have to make approximations. We're going to have to be either sound but not complete, complete but not sound, or some combination, as we saw on the, the prior depiction. Now, one technique for abstract interpretation towards making always sound analyses is to abstract the behavior of the program in such a way that a proof about the abstraction implies a proof about the real thing. So this idea was proposed by Patrick and Radia Cousseau, and their seminal paper on the idea was in 1977. Uh, it turns out it's the most cited Popple paper ever. So what do I mean about abstracting the program behavior? Well, let's consider a very simple programming language. Here, programs in our language are depicted with the meta variable e, and a program can either be some integer, let's call it n, or the sum of two other programs themselves consisting of uh, integers or sums of programs. Now, um, to abstract the meaning of our program, uh, to be able to prove properties about it, so we don't have to test every possible program in our language, we will define an abstraction function that takes an integer end and maps it to an abstract domain, in this case, the domain of signs. In this domain are three possible values, minus for all variables I'm sorry, for all numbers that are less than zero, zero for zero itself, or plus for all numbers that are greater than zero. Then we have an abstract semantics for programs written in this uh, simpler abstract. Uh, we have an abstract semantics for elements in this abstract domain. Uh, in particular, the abstract semantics is going to cover the one operation in our language, which is plus. And now instead of worrying about plus for all possible integers, I only need to worry about plus for my abstract elements. And so you can see that defined here in this table. Uh, two negative elements, when added together, will produce a negative element. Zero plus a negative element is still negative, uh, or plus a positive one is still positive, or plus itself is still zero. And uh, in fact, we can see that because of the uncertainty about what should happen when adding a positive and a negative element, we actually need a fourth element in our abstract domain, question mark, uh, because at this point we're just not sure. And the question mark in some sense refers to any possible value, either a positive, negative, or zero element. Now, the important thing is that if we wanted to prove something about uh, a program, we can prove it, and we can prove it about the abstract domain, it will hold for the original program. So in our signs example, if uh, the result of executing a program according to the abstract semantics was that that program was zero, then we know for sure it will be in the concrete semantics also. Uh, or if we say that it's positive or negative, we're sure that uh, whatever numbers we started out with from our abstraction function, we're, getting, we're going to uh, end up with a positive number if we really executed that program. Now, the signs domain is one possible abstract domain to make this sort of determination in, but we can look at other abstract domains that have been developed over the years too, such as intervals, which uh, bound a particular range of numbers, or convex polyhedra, or octagons, or pentagons, which are other ways of describing numeric relationships among variables. The abstract semantics for language constructs other than plus is relatively straightforward in uh, many cases, so for sequencing or for um, assigning variables and so on. And once again, this is a theme, the key challenge here is loops. 
how do we finitize our reasoning about programs with loops so that we are sure to have our analysis terminate and give us an answer that we know to be sound. And uh, there's a key idea that was developed, again, way back in the beginning, but it's been advanced and deepened since then, called widening, to uh, help accelerate termination of the analysis over loops um, while retaining a reasonable level of precision. Now, stepping back, um, one can view all static analysis as a kind of abstract interpretation, but uh, it's not really fair to ignore the rest of analysis techniques uh, just because you can make this, this connection. Uh, the setup can differ significantly amongst the ways that the analysis is expressed and implemented, and uh, that setup offers different precision and performance trade-offs. So if you use data flow analysis or symbolic execution or tag checking, these are all kinds of static analysis that one can relate to abstract interpretation, but have different uh, trade-offs, and it's worthwhile to express them directly rather than trying to shoehorn them into the mathematics of abstract interpretation directly. So static analysis is a rich research area. People are often trying to prove new properties about programs that haven't been focused on so much before, such as the absence of side channels that might leak secure information, or the use of proper use of resources so we don't exhaust memory, or data race freedom in multi-threaded programs. Uh, implementation methods are often important for making a static analysis work well, and so there's lots of research there in improving the performance and precision of different methods, say different abstract domains, using different searches or heuristics, uh, in deciding how to perform an analysis. And uh, recently, there's been lots of interesting connections between static analysis and machine learning methods. So at Popple, there were a bunch of papers on static analysis. Um, and they were all across the spectrum that I just described there, from ways of doing analysis, application domains for that analysis, um, and uh, different and new properties to consider. Two of the things I want to say about static analysis before moving on to uh, type systems. First of all, um, formal verification is, uh, comes from the area of so-called formal methods that's often, or, or at least started, as different from programming languages as a field. But many of the methods used by formalists and programming languages people are coming together and overlapping quite a lot. And so there's lots of interplay between these different areas. And now I would say formal verification is a very key part of programming languages research. Uh, what is it? Well, it's about proving at the limit functional correctness of a program. The program does what it's supposed to do, where what it's supposed to do is defined as a specification that, let's say in the simplest case, relates inputs to outputs. So to formally verify a program P is to show mathematically that it meets its specification, that is, for all inputs x, uh, the specification between x and the program's output holds. There's lots of uh, techniques now that have been developed to do this. A big um, area of interest now in the PL community is the use of so-called dependent types to express properties uh, about programs and to prove properties in general improve that programs enjoy those properties. And uh, of course, once again, the methods differ in important ways, both in terms of their the, the way that the proof is carried out, how much automation is used, in what language the specification is expressed, for example, what logic, and so on. Uh, a related area is program synthesis. Uh, in this case, we don't have the program, we just have the specification, and we want to generate a program that meets that specification. Uh, maybe we have a partial program, maybe we have a bunch of examples. Uh, there's lots of interesting ways of, of presenting the specification along with extra information to constrain the search pace, space of the synthesizer. And uh, the methods used by program synthesis research are also quite varied involving explicit search, enumeration, symbolic search, uh, taking advantage of types, piggybacking on top of uh, logic and formal verification. Uh, there's lots of really cool ideas here. And there are a bunch of uh, Popple papers that consider both of these topics, both verification 
uh, and synthesis. Okay, so now I want to turn to another area of static reasoning, uh, another kind of static analysis that's very popular in programming languages research, and that is type systems. So uh, what is a type system? A type system is a tractable, tractable syntactic method for proving the absence of certain program behaviors by classifying phrases in the program according to the kinds of values that they compute. So this is a definition by Benjamin Pierce from his book, Types and Programming Languages. Type systems typically are good at detecting errors. For example, don't add an integer in a string. You can have types for integers and strings and a type for plus, which does not allow you to combine an integer and a string and therefore exhibits that error. Types are good for abstraction, for information hiding, for example, and they're also great for documentation because they tersely summarize uh, what a function that is an API might do. And just like with static analysis, there are trade-offs between precision, efficiency, readability, and so on. So just to give you a flavor of what a type system looks like, here is a simple programming language. We have integers n, sums e plus e, and then we also have booleans, true and false, and equality judgments, E equals E, and finally conditionals. Uh, if the guard evaluates the true, then the result of the if is either the true branch in that case or else the false branch. In uh, our language, we'll have two types, int and bool, and we want to prove that expression E has type T. We'll use the type system to do that. And the notation we'll use is drawn from mathematical logic. It has this so-called turnstile, E colon tau, and uh, that can be read, E has type tau. This uh, mathematical formal statement is called a judgment, and we will use rules of inference that uh, we can combine, that we can piece together to form a proof that a particular judgment holds. So for example, um, we might have a judgment true has type bool, or a judgment uh, 1 plus 2 has type int, or a judgment that if 1 equals 1, then true, else false, and that that has type bool. Now, on the other hand, we won't be able to prove that, uh, in most cases, that if some expression, then 1 else false, uh, that is, we can't, using the type system that I presented here, um, give a type to this because it might return 1 or it might return false. And in most languages, even when you know what the guard is, you, your type system is probably too imprecise to realize that, hey, I know that the true branch is always going to be taken, and so in effect, this has type int. Uh, normally, the type system is not smart enough to prove that, even if it's actually true. So here are those rules of inference. The first one is an axiom. It says that all integers have type int, and all Booleans have type bool, both true and false do. These are axioms because they have no hypotheses above the line in those rules of inference. The more interesting rules of inference uh, have premises above the line, and they say, well, if E1 has type int, and if E2 has type int, then the sum of E1 and E2 also has type int. So the premises are hypotheses, and uh, if they hold, then the conclusion also follows. We also have a similarly styled rule for equality, and in this case, we require that E1 and E2 have the same type, but we don't care which type it is. And in that case, we can compare them, and the result at runtime will be a Boolean. Finally, for conditionals, we also require E1 and E2 to have the same type. That is, it should be possible um, for either branch to be taken, and if so, we need to give them both the same type to give a type to the entire expression. The guard should have type Boolean for this to make sense. Oh, and I should note that uh, this same style of using rules of inference is uh, used in expressing operational semantics also. Now, type systems, like abstract interpretation, are often designed to be sound. That is, uh, it, if E has type tau, then it really ought to be the case that when E evaluates, when it runs to conclusion, it really does produce a value of type tau, or else it, uh, it diverges, it never actually produces a final result. And this reduction is defined as operational semantics. Now, a corollary of this uh, judgment is that E will never get stuck if it is type correct. That is, it will ne never fail to reduce to a non-value. 
uh, for example, it won't ever produce one plus true because uh, there is no, that is not a value and there is no rule that can evaluate one plus true. And we can think of such a stuck program as representing a runtime error. The proof of soundness is often carried out by induction on the typing derivation, on the proof, the stringing together of the application of those logical rules. Uh, and so proof by induction, as it turns out, is uh, an extremely important part. It's central in proofs of properties uh, in programming languages research. Now, as I said, we can think of most static analyses as a kind of abstract interpretation. And a type system is a sort of static analysis. It applies to all programs E. It's a proof that they have some particular type T. And so uh, connecting to abstract interpretation, we can think of the type as the kind of abstract domain. Right? We, had, we saw the domain of signs before. That's maybe a bit more specific kind of integer type. Uh, and by type safety, we know that the analysis is sound. Now, most of the time we think of type systems as um, saying something about simple properties, like this value will be, this expression will be an integer when evaluated. But actually, uh, we can think of a type system as a methodology to prove even more interesting properties than just the representation of values. Uh, in particular, we can try to cleverly formulate, formulate an operational semantics for which a violation of some more generic property results in a stuck program, that is, one that does not produce a value. So, for example, if the program divides by zero or dereferences a null pointer or accesses an array out of bounds, then that program is unable to make progress. If we have a type system that proves, uh, for which we can prove type soundness, we know that none of these stuck programs are possible, that is, no division by zero or null pointer to reference or array out of bounds access are possible, and so therefore we have proved that the program enjoys that uh, corresponding property. Other properties uh, people have developed type systems for include uh, data races, so that you never do reference a pointer without holding the right lock, the use of tainted data for worrying about uh, whether adversaries might manipulate your program to do a SQL injection or something like that, dereferencing a dangling pointer, which would uh, indicate a use after free bug, and so on. So we formulate a type system that enforces the property uh, that we want, that is that none of these bad things happen, for example, and then by proving type safety, we're sure that, yep, none of them happen. So as an example, that ADS work, authenticated data structures work I talked about at the beginning, um, we, did it, we set it up exactly this way. We defined a language extension for using so-called recursive hashes. That's the key feature of an authenticated data structure. That is that the untrusted server is going to store a bunch of recursive hashes within the data structure, and those will be the basis of proofs sent back to the client after it does queries. We'll define an operational semantics that models the one-way nature of these hashes, and we have variants of that semantics for the verifier, that is the client and the prover, as well as the ideal, uh, that is the case of the program where we ignore the use of hashing altogether. So with those different semantics, we're able to, um, uh, to prove the property we want, that is that the type system uh, that we constructed, which ensures proper use of hashes, implies a safety theorem, and that safety theorem says that um, the program, when it is type correct, will never get stuck. And the only way it can uh, get to a place where it is stuck is through a violation of this uh, uh, security property. That is, that an attacker must have found a way to create a hash collision and to manipulate the program into doing the wrong thing. So um, only by finding this hash collision, which is the basis of uh, the security of the mechanism, can the server fool the client? And we assume, because of the basis, it's being the basis of that security mechanism, that it's extremely difficult to find that hash collision. So there's lots of research going on in type systems. Once again, uh, type systems themselves are, um, the idea is pretty well defined, and it's new type systems for new properties or uh, new algorithms that are of most interest. Type systems have a strong connection to logic, so one common thing is to 
draw ideas from logic or to connect type systems back to logic. Oftentimes, uh, people look to develop type systems with additional precision to prove new properties or to support new language constructs. So there were several Popple 19 papers that involved type system work uh, as their central idea. And actually, there are, there are several more than, uh, than just these. Uh, types are probably a part of half the papers that appeared at Popple, just um, as part of the work along the way and not such a central element. Okay, so next I want to talk about dynamic reasoning. So far we've talked about implementation, semantics, and static reasoning. Now I want to talk about dynamic reasoning, which is to uh, reason about program executions. And, uh, and why do we want to do that? Well, recall Rice's theorem. There is no sound and complete static analysis for interesting properties and languages. And so what that means is that if we limit our reasoning about programs to type systems or static analyses, we're going to reject some programs that exhibit a property, even though uh, they exhibit it, we're going to reject them anyway, we'll be overly conservative. Uh, or if you're a static analysis and we don't reject the program, we'll at least emit a false alarm about it. So one way to avoid this is to allow the program to run uh, despite the possibility that it violates this property and to watch for that violation at runtime, signaling an alarm if the property is indeed violated, if a monitor can observe uh, during execution that the property is violated. And we might perform this monitoring during testing just as a, a way of exploring whether uh, there's a possibility of a problem or we could do it during deployment. For example, this is what uh, dynamic typing does uh, in dynamically typed programming languages. Now, as it turns out, most type systems do not try to prove uh, an index to an array is always within bounds. This is a case where uh, it would simply be too restrictive, too many reasonable programs would be rejected uh, if we were to require the type system always prove that array accesses are in bounds. And so as a compromise, um, many languages are implemented with the compiler adding dynamic checks. Okay, so the idea is if the compiler is able to prove that an index is always in bounds, the program is just compiled directly. If it can't prove that, it will add a dynamic check using some metadata that tracks the length of the array to make sure is this particular index in bounds or not. So what this does is it, in a sense, adds precision to the type system or analysis. That is, it allows more programs, but at the cost of some additional runtime monitoring, some runtime overhead, and also the chance of failure. Now there's a way that uh, the program could fail at runtime, but at least it will fail in a predictable manner and hopefully uh, quickly rather than later and unpredictably. So this is a combination of static and dynamic reasoning. Now recently there's been uh, some interest in other ways of combining static and dynamic reasoning and uh, in particular combining static and dynamic type systems and this is uh, an area called gradual or migratory typing and um, it's gaining in popularity where languages that started as dynamically typed languages are, at, are getting type systems added onto them where those type systems add value but don't subtract from, uh, from the precision, from the ability to check uh, as many programs as, as the original allowed it to. So there are a bunch of uh, Popple 19 papers that involve gradual typing or uh, runtime monitoring and uh, you can see a list of them here. So this concludes my tour of the Programming Language Researcher's Toolbox. It contains mathematics and implementation techniques that are widely applicable. That is, with these techniques, we can make it, whatever it is, more general, more elegant, more direct, more efficient, more reliable, more secure. And Programming Language's researchers are looking at many kinds of it, whether it's machine learning, or quantum computing, or cryptography, or security, or natural language processing. You name it, the key questions in computer science often can enjoy an elegant, general, direct, efficient, reliable solution by taking advantage of ideas from the programming languages community. I hope that you agree. So to recap, what's PL research? 
Field research views the programming language as having a central place in solving computing problems. A PL researcher develops general abstractions or building blocks for solving problems or classes of problems. It, the PL researcher considers software behavior in a rigorous and general way. For example, to prove that classes of programs enjoy properties that we want or eschew properties that we don't. I encourage you to check it out.